Here at the Four Boxes Diner, we try to connect dots so you can use it in defending our right to keep and bear arms. Well, today, the Wall Street Journal ran an op-ed by chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov, who literally just made the case for arms in America. Stay tuned. Let's talk about it. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Dinah, proud American gunner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of the brand new best-selling book, Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. There's a lot of lessons in that book that we in America can learn from the mistakes that the Ukrainians made and how they're responding to the invasion of the Russians. Remember, we always want to learn from the mistakes and conduct and activities of others. It's a lot better than making the mistakes ourselves. Check out the book Disarmed. Don't forget to follow me on at Four Boxes Diner as well. And uh, a lot to talk about today. All right, folks. So Wall Street Journal ran an op-ed today by Gary Kasparov. Now, if you don't know who Gary Kasparov is, you may want to at least know this. He is one of the greatest chess players of all times. He was a chess grandmaster. Uh, he was number one in the world literally for something like 255 months straight. Back in the day at the age of 22, he was the youngest ever cr crowned uh, chess grandmaster. So he's the man when it comes to chess. Very smart guy, Gary Kasparov. He also escaped from the Soviet Union and Russia, has been anti-Putin for a very long time, uh, worried about civil rights and civil liberties all around the world, including, of course, where he comes from in Russia. Back when he was there, of course, it was the Soviet Union. Now, I bring this up to put this into context because he made a very powerful argument about the Ukraine. Now, as you know, I just wrote this book called Disarm the uh the, the disarmed, which is what the war in Ukraine can teach Americans about the right to bear arms. And the point of that book was, by the way, not necessarily take a position on what the United States role should be in the Ukraine, although I think we can all agree the Russians are the bad guys. Uh, but nevertheless, that doesn't set all policies all the time. But the point of the book was not to focus on the Ukrainian conflict as much as what lessons can we as American gun owners learn about the war in Ukraine, and what lessons can we take away from that war about some of the things the Ukrainians did, including, but not limited to, they contemplated adopting a private uh, right to bear arms about a decade before the Russian invasion, which if, had they done that would have allowed to have a very robust armed citizenry, um, maybe not on par with what we have in the United States, but certainly better than they had, but they chose not to do that. And of course, next thing you know, the Russians invade. And they're trying to teach their citizens how about how to use arms uh, in an expedited way, which is really not optimal. Now, I put that into context to talk about a powerful statement that Gary Kasparov made that I think we here in the United States can use to defend our right to keep and bear arms. Specifically, what Gary Kasparov wrote in this op-ed, which is entitled Ukrainians Die as America Dawdles. He talks about, about how... Um, that, you know, by not being more aggressive toward the Russians, uh, according to his view, is this allows the Russians to attack innocent civilians. Now, again, this video is not about the Ukraine war. It's about lessons that we in America can take from the Ukraine war and the discussions associated with it to defend our right to keep and bear arms. So what I found here when I read this article is a powerful line that Gary Kasparov made, and it got me thinking about something that we here in the United States can do to defend the Second Amendment whenever something some psychopath does a mass shooting and the anti-gunners try to take advantage of the survivors and those appeals to emotion as opposed to do what should be done, which is to protect Americans the same way we protect our politicians, which is with guns. Okay, so specifically what Gary Kasparov uh, wrote here, and he was really attacking in a sense Joe Biden and those people that supposedly support the war in Ukraine from the Ukrainian point of view against the Russians. This is what Gary Kasparov wrote, quote, President Biden... President Biden, instead of offering thoughts and prayers for Ukrainian lives, send planes and guns to save them. Period. Close quote. Not Mark Smith. That was Gary Kasparov talking to Joe Biden. Quote, President Biden, instead of offering thoughts and prayers for Ukrainian lives, send planes and guns to save them. Period. Close quote. And that's a critical point we've been making on this channel, that... It's checkmate, pardon the pun about chess, right? It's checkmate on the left because Joe Biden wants to take guns away from you and I to leave us exposed to the barbarians in all of its forms, whether it be the common criminal or whatever, but they want to expose us. And yet at the same time, they're trying to arm Ukrainian citizens using American taxpayer dollars. So I think that's checkmate on the question of whether or not guns save lives. And here you have Gary Kasparov saying, 
Dear Joe Biden, don't talk about protecting Ukrainians. Send us guns, which, by the way, I thought we'd been doing, but set that issue aside. Now, here's what got me thinking and why I think we can use this in our favor when we have to fight the anti-gunners after these mass shootings. Let's just chat for a second about how a typical mass shooting plays out in the media with the anti-gunners and their handmaidens in the mainstream media. There's some crazy shooting in whatever it is, southern Ohio or something like that, by some nut job. And next thing you know, uh, the politicians in that part of the country, you know, will issue some statements that say, properly so, you know, our hearts and thoughts and prayers go out to the victims and their families. We pray and hope that they recover and things get better, which is, of course, the right and civilized thing to do to wish well on people who are suffering problems, whether it be they get a, can a cancer diagnosis or they're victims of a hurricane, or victims of an earthquake, or whatever it is, we as humans, you know, especially Americans, who are the most philanthropic people on the planet by far, are always very giving and hopeful and, and, and prayerful when it comes to hoping that others do better. Uh, we don't want them to suffer through pain and the like. But, that's, and, but here's the key point. When those politicians, if they're Republicans or receive money from the NRA, or they're good on the Second Amendment, or they defend the Constitution, inevitably what happens when they send out that communique, uh, that notation, that tweet, whatever it is that says, thoughts and prayers to the victims, the anti-gunners, it's almost like they planned it, the anti-gunners have a plan, a battle plan that they pull off the shelves, as best I could tell, and deploy it. And what is that battle plan? Well, it's several things, but one of the critical things is they try to embarrass Republican politicians. They try to embarrass supporters of the Second Amendment by saying, hey, screw your thoughts and prayers, Congressman. You're a Republican in the back pocket of the gun rights groups like the NRA. You support the Second Amendment. You support guns in the gun industry. And you are terrible. You're evil. You're part of the problem. If you really care about these victims, you should do something, which means, of course, pass more nonsensical, useless laws that we already have laws against murder and rape and robbery, etc. So obviously these are stupid things, but this is what happens when the anti-gunners respond to politicians that are supportive of the Second Amendment when they say, again, thoughts and prayers to the victims, which of course is the common courtesy thing that one should do as an American and as a human, and people do do here in this country. So I'm just thinking that here you have maybe what we should do going forward, and I'm going to ask you for help on this. Feel free in the comments below to recommend language that maybe I can use and maybe others can use. I'll recommend it on Twitter and beyond. Uh, maybe in my interviews on Fox News, you never know when I get an opportunity to talk about this stuff. Uh, but here's what I'm thinking. Maybe what we should say is, you know, we should say something like, yeah, thanks for the thoughts and prayers. Now send guns like you do for the Ukraine, or something like that. In other words, we should come up with a line here. You know how we help develop the notion of you are your own first responder? Um, that's something that's now used ubiquitously around the gun rights movement, and that's great. Um, the other thing, of course, is I think we should develop something here that says, in, you know, in addition to thoughts and prayers, we need to send guns, or we should be sending guns or men with guns ahead of time to places like this, the same way we do in the, you know, for the Ukrainians by sending them guns, something like that. But we want to work on this because remember, never forget, we always want to take advantage and show the hypocrisy of the left and the anti-gunners. So here you have a situation. By the way, I'm not saying Gary Gasparov is anti-gun. I'm just saying here he is making the case for Joe Biden to send guns, right? He says, forget your thoughts. You know, thoughts and prayers are great, but please send guns. And I think that's true. And for example, in the Nashville situation where you have that, that shooter, again, you needed people to show up with guns before you took out that uh, that trans artist shooter or whoever she was uh, in the Nashville school there. So yes, guns do save lives, which is why we surround our politicians with them. But I also want to remind you of a very famous person, which we've talked about on this channel before. It speaks to the Gary Kasparov thing to some degree. It speaks to the importance of guns and thwarting uh, bad people from doing bad things. And that is the 18th century criminologist and philosopher, Cesar Beccaria, who wrote a very famous book uh, in the 1760s, as you know, over a decade before the American Revolution, over a decade before the Declaration of Independence. And this is extremely important because Cesar Beccaria made all the points that you hear, not just on the Four Monsters channel, but throughout the gun rights community, 
including by gun rights organizations, including the NRA, but none of these concepts we articulate about the importance of men that, that if you ban guns, you only help out the criminals. These are not 21st century ideas. These ideas come go all the way back to the 18th century to before our country was even a country, to before the Declaration of Independence, and yes, before the Constitution, and yes, before the Second Amendment. And I want to remind you what Cesar Beccaria said in his uh, in his chapter on in a book on crimes and punishments, which he wrote in 1764. And I think it's very important. I'll put a list. Uh, here's what he writes. Quote, False is the idea of utility. That sacrifices a thousand real advantages for one imaginary or trifling inconvenience that would take fire from men because it burns, right? You take fire away from men because it burns. Risk of fire, but there's a lot of good stuff from fire. You take water, you would take water away because one might drown. And again, a lot of good things come out of water, a lot of positive things for society out of water, but yeah, you can drown in it, right? But that doesn't mean we ban fire or ban water. That was the point of Cesar Beccaria. But then Beccaria continued onwards. He says that the laws that, for, this is him, his language, not mine, quote, the laws that forbid the carrying of arms are laws of such a nature. He's comparing bans on the carrying of guns and the bans on guns, no different than banning fire or water because any marginal benefit, if there are any, is overwhelmed by the positives. But then he goes on to say there's not even a benefit from those because here's what he says. Beccari says, the laws that forbid the carrying of arms are laws of such a nature. They disarm those only who are neither inclined nor determined to commit crimes. In other words, he, they disarm the law-abiding. Beccaria goes on in 1764, can it be supposed that those who have the courage to violate the most sacred laws of humanity, the most important of the code, will respect the less important and arbitrary laws which can be violated with ease and impunity and which, if strictly obeyed, would put an end to personal liberty? Again, if you're going to commit murder, robbery, and rape, what is an extra you know, year or so? What do you care about like a gun crime? It's irrelevant to you. So he goes on to say that, and this is the key, so dear to men, so dear to the lightened legislature and, sub and subject innocent persons. This is the key. Most important part of what Beccaria says, subject innocent persons to vexations that the guilty alone ought to suffer. In other words, punish the guilty, not the lie -bond. If some psychopath shoots up a school, Punish the bad guy and don't punish some law-abiding gun owners, you know, thousands of miles away. That's absurd. Cesar Beccaria, 1764, inspired the founding fathers to, among other things, write the Second Amendment, right to keep in arms. The last thing and the most powerful thing that Beccaria says that speaks to this very issue is this, quote, gun laws, gun ban laws, quote, make things worse for the assaulted and better for the assailants. They serve rather than to encourage than to prevent homicides for an unarmed man may be attacked with greater confidence than an armed man. Perry, close quote. Caesar Beccaria, criminologist, 1764, over a decade before the American Revolution and years before our Second Amendment. This man was known by all of the founding fathers. His language that I just read to you was literally written down in their common books by none other than Thomas Jefferson and also by John Adams. That's how inspired our founding fathers were by the words of Cesar Beccaria. And of course, what also speaks to is the Beccaria language of the 18th century speaks to exactly what Gary Kasparov, the chess grandmaster, says when he speaks to Joe Biden, specifically, don't just send thoughts and prayers, send guns. Because we know that guns protect law-abiding, they protect the innocent, and they deter bad behavior, which is why our political elites, our Hollywood elites... Our religious elites, the royal elites, when they are, there's a coronation, and so on and so on, including the Wall Street elites and the billionaire elites, they all are surrounded with guns. Because remember, they don't think guns are bad. They just think that you having guns are bad. That's the difference. But remember, every day in America, we have our guns and our gun rights. We can buy guns and ammunition, and our Second Amendment rights is another day in favor of freedom, and it is a good day. Okay. All right, folks, I hope you learned a little bit something here about connecting those dots. There's a lot of dots and things to learn about this debate over the Ukraine and guns in our favor. And I'm going to keep bringing you these kinds of tidbits. Gary Kasparov, I think, did us a favor, even though he was writing about, you know, the American support of the Ukraine in, in the Russian fight. Uh, but I still think there were lessons there to be learned 
up and used here by the Second Amendment community. So again, if you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner, please do so. Check us out on Twitter at Four Boxes Diner. And again, we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.